Quick confession time. I worry about money. Does anybody else ever worry about money? Yeah. Probably pretty common. You know, the interesting thing about it is, for as much as I worry about money, and then compare that to as much time as I spend in church. Now, as most of you know, I'm a, a cradle Presbyterian. I was born in the Presbyterian church. And unlike my education, I have spent more Sundays in church than I have missed. So it's interesting to consider that for all this worrying that I've done about money, that I do about money, that the church has never really spent a whole lot of time talking about it. I mean, when I was a kid, in our Sunday school class, we would collect money, and we would take that money, and we would use it to buy an animal of some sort, like a, um, a goat or a chicken or a rabbit to send to a village far away through Heifer International. Every year through Vacation Bible School, we would have a mission project we would collect our pennies for, and we would try to save up that one mission project. But we never really talked about finances in the church. Not really much at all. Which is kind of odd when you realize that you and I are not alone in our concern about money. Last year, CreditCards.com did a survey. And in that survey, they found out that 65% of all Americans lose sleep over money. So that's not just worrying, that's worrying and staying up at night worrying about money. I mean, if there's one thing that stresses me out, it's, it's, it's money. Even in the best of situations, even when life is wonderful and grace, I can, I can still find some reason to get stressed out about money. I admit, this is not healthy. I mean, like, if I had $200 to go to the grocery store, and I only spent $150, and I had everything on the list, I would still be stressed out about having to spend $150 rather than saving $50. It's not rational. <laughs> but for some reason, it's there. And it's really odd that if all of us have this, or at least many of us, have this sometimes irrational concern and worry about money, it is incredibly odd that we don't spend time talking about it in the church. Especially when Jesus spent a great deal of time in the Gospels and in his ministry teaching and talking about money. Teaching and talking about stewardship, which is something we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks as we work through the narrative lectionary. You know, if ever there is any sort of discussion about this worry about money, Sometimes we'll sum it up in that last line of scripture that Jesus has here that uh, we read this morning. Where we say that Jesus says, So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And then we can just boil it down to, so don't worry so much. That's great advice, isn't it? <laughs> but it's hard to do. So let's assume for a moment that I've got a handle on my own personal finances. Like I said, let's assume. Let's assume for a moment that I'm not worried about my own finances. I still leave the church. There's still church finances that I can definitely worry about. You know, I'm a member of an online community called uh, Things They Didn't Teach Us in Seminary. <laughs> There can be a whole subcategory dedicated to church finances. I never had a single class in seminary about a church budget, about fundraising. The only thing I can recall from seminary when it came to finances in the church is that when you have people who are counting the offering plate, make sure to have at least two people there counting the money. And if not, if it's only one person, make sure that one person is bonded. That's it. That's all we learned about when it came to finances in seminary. Kind of odd, don't you think? So it used to be that people just gave money to the church, because that's what you were supposed to do. Right? We hadn't done that in a while. Does anybody know, out of curiosity, uh, when uh, Protestant churches in America started taking up collections? Started taking up the offering. Do y'all know when that happened? Wasn't until 
1800s. Up until then, the church got their funding in lots of different ways. They got their funding sometimes from the state. They got their funding sometimes from individuals. They got their funding by businesses that they were engaged in. Some of them kind of unsavory businesses. So they had other ways of getting income. Income. It wasn't until the 1800s that people started giving to the mission and the ministry of the church to support the church. This last year, a colleague recommended a book to me. The book is written by a guy named J. Cliff Christopher, and it's called Not Your Parents' Offering Plate. You'll probably be hearing a lot about that in weeks ahead. Our session has read it, and we've talked about it. In Not Your Parents' Offering Plate, Christopher makes the point that since the 1950s, uh, there's been a decline in church giving. Up until that point, um, from the 1800s until that time, it was just assumed that you gave 10% your tithe to the church. Because when you want to do good in the world as a Christian, you did that through your local church. It was your local church that made sure that people were fed and clothed and supported missionaries around the world. But since the 1950s, things have changed. Things have changed, and people's attitudes and beliefs about giving have changed, but the church is still doing the same thing. One of the points that he makes is that since 1950, we have had this boom of nonprofit businesses, all for good reasons. One estimate has it at 1.1 million nonprofit businesses in the United States today. 370,000 of those nonprofits are churches. That means that churches are competing with 730,000 other nonprofits for their piece of the charitable giving pie. Now, how many of you have gotten a letter from a nonprofit in the past? Raise your hand. Right. And they tell you all the great things they're doing, right? And they are. They're doing great things. And they tell you, you can be a part of that. They tell you that you can be a part of the great things they are doing by the way that you support that nonprofit. How many of you have gotten a letter like that from a church? See the difference? I mean, churches may send out the annual stewardship letter, but we are not keeping up with the ways that people believe about giving. And again, this is a situation about Money. And Jesus talked about money. So why are we not talking more about money in the church? There's a Lutheran pastor in Minnesota. I want to make sure I get the quote right. Uh, and he says, his name is Carl Jacobson, and he says, Worry, worry can separate us from our God and choke out our generosity. Worry can separate us from our God and choke out our generosity. That's powerful. And that makes a lot of sense <laughs> to me. Because when I worry, when I get scared, especially when I worry and get scared on behalf of others, ball up, or become a turtle, or a rolling bully, or an armadillo, or whatever animal or insect works for you that wraps in on itself when it's worried about what's happening around it. Worry and fear can lead us into wrapping in on ourselves. Not always necessarily worry and fear for ourselves. I think many of us, if we have a worry or a fear that directs us confrontly, for many of us that spurs us to greater action. But when we are worried about those we love, those we care about, that's when we start to keep our resources to ourselves. Does anybody remember Y2K? Yeah. So for those of you who don't remember or have conveniently forgotten, when the year 2000 rolled around, there was this great fear. Uh, fear that all the electrical systems on the planet were going to explode or something because of the way dates were being entered. Up to that point, the year date was entered with two digits. After that, it was going to have to be 
be four digits. You know, prior to the year 2000, when I would enter my birth date into an electronic device, it would be 113077. Now it's 113977. And people were incredibly worried about this. So worried that people started hoarding supplies, preparing for the apocalypse. There was a family of a friend of ours in college who had so many canned goods stockpiled and stocked and stacked up in the corner of their garage that the weight of the canned goods cracked the slab of their house. Nice. <laughs> and this is a pretty common trope in you know the near future apocalyptic setting of things that there's not going to be enough for everybody. So we have to hold on to what we have to protect it from other people. That's what we're supposed to do because we are worried. Carl Jacobson says that worry can choke us off from God, can choke out our generosity. And I think the opposite of that is true as well. Generosity can bring us closer to God. Generosity can choke out that worry. Over the next few weeks, like I said, we're going to be looking at some passages about stewardship. And we're going to try to move it from just a simple understanding of stewardship, of what you do with what you got, to an idea of generous stewardship. Uh, some years ago, I was at a dinner that was honoring a man for his philanthropy in the community in a certain aspect. And when he got the award, he got up to speak, and he said that there, he wanted to challenge the common understanding or the common saying of give until it hurts. He says, don't give until it hurts. Give until it feels good. If you give until it hurts, you stop giving too soon. Keep giving until it feels good. Generosity can draw us closer to God. Generosity can choke out worry. When Jesus talks about money in Scripture, Jesus talks about it by saying, in one of the cases here, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Well, if we are worried, if we are afraid, we armadillo up, and those treasures come right to us. And that's where our heart is. I think the reason Jesus wants to talk about worry is because Jesus knows that if we are worrying, that means we are not trusting in God. If we are worrying, we are trusting in ourselves and in our own abilities or inabilities to take care of things. But if we have that generous spirit, it can open us up to God. Generosity can choke out worry. Generosity can get us closer to God. And so as we think about stewardship over the next few weeks, bear that in mind. Bear in mind also that this past week, the session of the church has put together a working budget for 2019. It's a budget that's going to challenge us financially. It's going to challenge us spiritually too. Because it's going to make us ask the question, are we worried about our budget? Or are we worried about what we're doing with our budget? Are we going to be generous? Are we going to be able to say that our heart is concerned about our budget? Or that our heart is concerned about the ministry and the gospel of Jesus Christ changing lives in this community? <coughs> Amen. Thank you.